that we learn of you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you will, this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, it is not my intention to study this entire chapter today. It is not even my intention to study half of this chapter today. We are going to cover one verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. Now, we'll also be in a number of other scriptures, but our, our launch pad today is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Now, let me say, first of all, that the chapter and verse divisions that we find in our Bibles are not inspired, okay? Uh, in fact, sometimes they don't even make a whole lot of sense. They were added later for our reference so that it would be easy for us to look things up. But there are certain occasions where a particular verse or even a passage of verses seems more appropriate with the text from a previous chapter than it does for the chapter that it's in. And I think this is one of those verses. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And actually, it's not the verse that said that. It was the Apostle Paul that said that, right? The Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian church, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the example that he has given in the previous passages. The idea of setting aside one's own liberties, one's own rights for the good of others and for the good of the body of Christ. Paul is saying, listen, when I do this, I didn't come up with this. This is what Jesus did. He set aside his glory to become one of us and to suffer and die for our sins. He humbled himself, we're told in Philippians, even to the point of death, even the death on the cross, right? He did that for us in submission to the Father, but the end goal was to save our souls. He set aside his rights. He set aside his liberty for the good of others. And Paul is saying, I'm imitating Jesus when I do that. And so I want you to imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Paul is saying, follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus. Now, our topic today is this, this idea of following others who are following Christ, or perhaps following Christ because we recognize that there are others who are following us. Amen? It's about following good examples and about being a good example. Now, some people get this wrong, and they get it wrong in a number of ways. There are those in the world today, those in the media, those in politics and other things, even those in the ministry who will say, follow me right? Follow me. Do what I do. Send your checks here. <laughs> you know, follow me. Politicians want us to follow them. Endorsement deals suggest that we should follow our heroes and our athletes, right? Charles Barkley famously said, just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. He did not like the idea of being held up as a role model just because he was good at basketball, right? Charles Barkley took a different approach to the follow me. He said, don't follow me. Some people say, follow me, right? Other people say, don't follow me. I'm not an example that you should be following. Just don't follow me. Now, sometimes that sounds great, that someone's being humble and they're acknowledging that they're not an example that should be followed. But if you really peel back the veneer of that statement, what they're really saying is, I don't want the responsibility of having to be a good example for you. So just don't follow me, right? Neither of those attitudes are correct. You can't say, follow me, nor can you say, don't follow me. Now, sometimes we like to hyper-spiritualize this statement and say, don't follow me, follow Jesus. Doesn't that sound good? That does, doesn't it? It sounds good. And it is good in so far as it goes. We are to keep our eyes upon Jesus. Amen? Uh, turn with me briefly to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, 
there is some debate about who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. I am of the opinion that it was the Apostle Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews. But whether it was Paul or not, we know that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1, the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, of course, when we see the word therefore, we have to ask ourselves, what's it there for, right? He's saying that because of the great cloud of witnesses that were just just uh, enumerated for us in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of faith where it talks about by faith Abraham did this, by faith Isaac did that, by faith Moses did this, by faith Rahab did that, where it talks about what faith is and who all these examples in the faith are. We have these examples, right? We have all of these examples that we saw in Hebrews chapter 11. And the writer of Hebrews is pointing back to those people and he's saying, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, please understand this this idea of witnesses. Sometimes we get the wrong impression about this statement. We think that when he says, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it's like that all of these heroes of the faith are up in the bleachers watching us and that they're cheering us on. Yeah, yeah, you can do it, go for it, run that. Sometimes we think since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we think that what that means is that they're witnessing us, right? Since they're watching, let's do this. That's not what it means. It's not witnesses in the bleachers, it's witnesses in the witness stand, right? In other words, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of people who have given testimony to the faith, right? since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of examples, examples. So because we have such a great cloud of examples, because we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us do something. What are we to do? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? Oh, what a beautiful exhortation that is. Listen, yes, we are to look to Jesus. Yes, we can say, hey, don't follow me, man, follow Jesus. There's some truth to that statement because we are ultimately to follow Jesus, but that does not excuse us from being a good example to others. Even as the writer of Hebrews pointed back to Hebrews chapter 11 saying, look at all these examples. Now go follow Jesus, right? They walked in faith, so we are to walk in faith as we run with endurance the race that is set before us. Amen? And it helps us when we are running a race that is set before us, as we are running after Jesus, as we are following him, it helps us to be able to look at examples of others who have done likewise. Amen? But the key here in Paul's statement in Hebrews 11.1 1 is this, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, if for any reason I stop following Christ, then you should stop following me. I knew a man once who had been out of church for many, many years. And uh, he had had grown up, he'd had a rough life, he had struggled with alcoholism and and all kinds of different problems that, that go along with that. But he'd, got, he'd gotten saved. He was born again. He, he loved the Lord. He was going to a church. It was actually a church here in the area. And, 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 uh, and he, was, he was growing in, in his faith. And he was doing well. But then the pastor of the church where he attended fell into sin. He uh, fell into the sin of adultery and, and uh, ended up losing his marriage and his ministry. And when that man fell, this other man that I know fell as well. He fell away, not because he committed some horrible sin, but because the man that he had been following as an example to him had failed. And it undermined this this man's faith. 
He said, if that guy couldn't do it, if that guy couldn't walk this walk, if that guy couldn't live this life, then what makes me think I can do it? What makes me think I can walk this walk? What makes me think I can live this life? And he fell away. And for years, he was out in the world again, backslidden, living a life that was not bringing glory and honor to God. Fortunately, uh, before he died, when I met this man, he had gotten back into fellowship. He had become a part of a a loving community of believers who had encouraged him, who had shown him grace, who had welcomed him back in, and who had given him a godly example. Now, does that mean that it was that pastor's fault who fell? Well, a lot of you are shaking your head no. I'm going to say, yeah, it is that guy's fault, but it was the man's responsibility. Does that make sense? If I fall and give you a bad example, it's my fault that I fell and gave you a bad example. That was my fault. If your faith is injured or if your walk is is made harder because of my bad example, that is my fault. But it is your responsibility, right? It is your responsibility to continue following Christ. It's your responsibility to be able to see Insofar as Pastor Ken ran after Jesus, he was a good example. But at the point where he stumbled and fell away, at that point, I stop following his example and keep my eyes focused on Jesus Christ. No person who ever sins or falls in any way, shape, or form should cause you to stop following after Jesus. They are giving you an example but it is Jesus who is the author and the finisher, or in other words, the originator and the perfecter of our faith. Too often, people look at Christians and reject Christianity. They look at Christians and the ways in which we stumble and fall and the ways in which we are occasionally a bad example, and they say, well, if that's what it is to be a Christian, then I don't like Christianity. If that's what it is to be a Christian, then I don't like Christ. That is like, okay, it's like taking a nine-year-old to the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth and giving that child an easel and a paintbrush and a set of acrylics and setting them in front of a masterpiece, a Rembrandt, let's say. And that child looks at that Rembrandt and begins to paint it and they are trying to to make a a good replica of that Rembrandt right and then they show it to you and you say oh that's horrible now of course none of you are mean enough to say to a nine-year-old that their art is horrible I know that but you might look at that and say wow that's really that's really not a very good picture I don't like art do you see what I'm saying You're not going to look at an imperfect reproduction and based upon that imperfect reproduction, decide that you don't like art because it was an imperfect reproduction. What you need to look at to determine whether or not you like art is the masterpiece itself. We, at best, are imperfect reproductions of Jesus. We need to keep our eyes focused upon him, amen? Because he is the author and the finisher, the originator and perfecter of our faith. Now, this isn't my point today, but I can't read over these verses without addressing this. In order to run with endurance the race that is set before us, there are certain things we need to do. And that is we need to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, right? What does that mean? That means that there are certainly sinful behaviors sinful habits, that sin that so easily ensnares you, that particular area where you fall into temptation and it's difficult for you to resist. And in order to effectively run the race, you need to set that sin aside, right? You need to be willing to to step away from that sin, to repent of that sin, to turn from that sin and turn to God for grace and mercy, right? If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. And I think there's some of you that need to hear this because I know every once in a while I need to hear this. That sin that you committed way back before you came to Christ, that sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. 
But let me tell you something else. That sin that you committed last week, even after you've been following Christ for a while, that area in which you just blew it, you fell flat on your face and walked willfully into disobedience, and now you're, you're feeling it. You're feeling the pain of that sin. Listen, I'm telling you, if you will confess that sin to the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive you for that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And guess what? That sin you committed last week is covered by the blood of Jesus. And you know that sin that you committed this morning on your way here when you were speaking sign language to the guy who cut you off on the road? I apologize. That sin can be forgiven too. That sin can be covered by the blood of Jesus. Listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, we do not have to live with condemnation because the Bible tells us there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, amen? Does that mean that we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course, how can we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Our desire is to walk free from sin but if you have sinned, I want you to understand, I want you to, I want you to feel this this morning. There's grace for you in Christ Jesus. He knows you're not perfect. The standard is perfection, but he knows you don't meet that standard. Praise the Lord, he already met that standard. Amen. He took our unrighteousness upon himself and he imputed his righteousness to us. But as we run the race, which by the way is a marathon, not a sprint, right? That's why we are to run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's also personal. The race that is set before you is not the race that is set before me, and the race that is set before me is not the race that is set before someone else. And you say, but wait a minute. If we're all following Jesus, how can we have different races? We can all have a different race set before us, even though we're all following Jesus, because we may all end at the same point, but we didn't all start at the same point. And so the road that I'm on and the path that I have to walk is a little different maybe than the path that you have to walk or the road that you're on. In other words, we all face different challenges, don't we? We all face different challenges. We all have different obstacles that we have to overcome. But ultimately, we're all following the lead runner who is Jesus. Amen? But if I'm out on the track and I don't know which way to go, and I see people running this way, and I can see up ahead that it's Jesus that they're following, then I can get into pace with them and we can run together, right? And that's what Paul is saying when he says, follow me as I follow Christ Jesus. Now, one other thing we need to notice here is the writer of Hebrews doesn't just say lay aside every sin that so easily ensnares you. He also says lay aside every weight. Now, he is not simply finding two different ways to say the same thing. He's talking about two different things. There are sins that so easily ensnare, ensnare us, but there are also weights that we carry that hinder our ability to run the race that aren't necessarily sin. There are things in your life that are not in and of themselves sinful, but if you're trying to carry the weight of those things, you're not going to be able to effectively run the race that is set before you. There are attitudes, there are actions, there are behaviors, and there are habits that while they are not necessarily sinful, do impede your ability to run the race. And those are not necessarily going to be the same things for every person. But we need each one to examine our own hearts, to examine our own lives, and to ask the question, is there something that I am doing or not doing that is keeping me from running effectively after Jesus Christ? I'll give you one example from my own life, something that I struggle with and that I really need to improve in regards to my practice as I walk with God. How many of you would agree that it is important to start the day with prayer and time in the word. How many of you would agree with that? Yeah? Man, I'll tell you what. It's like, it's like you can leave the radio on all day, but it's important to tune in the dial first thing in the morning, right? Now, that having been said, let me ask a separate question. Is it a sin to stay up late? No. No. It's not a sin to stay up late, especially if you're doing something important like preparing a Bible study or, 
you know, maybe doing some housework or, you know, th there are things you could do, right? Even if you're just watching a show with your, with your significant other, right? There's nothing wrong with staying up late. But if I get into the habit of staying up late and because of that, I'm not getting enough sleep, which means I wake up in the morning with just enough time to get out the door and don't have time to actually get before the Lord before I leave the house, that thing, staying up late, is hindering my race, isn't it? And so that is a weight that I need to lay aside. No, for real, guys, it's a weight that I need to lay aside. Pray for me. I need to go to bed earlier, right? I mean, honestly, if I were in bed by midnight every night, it would be a huge improvement. That's how bad it is. It's, I need to repent in that area. Not because it's a sin, but because that habit is hindering my race, right? So what about you? What is there in your life? Take a moment and think about that. What is going on in your life right now that is keeping you from effectively running the race that God has set before you? Not necessarily a sin, but something you really need to think about changing because you would be more effective in following Christ if you would bring that area of your life under control. Amen? So when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, he does not have confidence in himself in that moment. His confidence ultimately is in the Lord, okay? And if you're going to say, follow me as I follow Christ, you cannot say that with self-confidence. You have to say that with Christ confidence, okay? Turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1 for the sake of context, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Now, I just want to go on record and say Paul did not have a dog phobia, <laughs> right? Um, he is speaking metaphorically. He says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Judaizers who were coming in and who were trying to tell the Philippian Christians that in order to truly follow Christ, you had to essentially become a Jew. You had to follow the Jewish customs, chief among them circumcision, that you had to be circumcised. And Paul is saying, this is absolutely not true. Do not be uh, do not be dissuaded by them. Do not be discouraged by them. Don't be distracted by them. You can just ignore them, essentially, is what he's saying. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul is saying, look, do not have confidence in your own performance. Do not have confidence in your flesh. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Paul is saying, look, I'm telling you, if anybody had the right to be confident in their flesh, it would be me. And he gives his resume here. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel. That was the day upon which Israel, uh, Israelite babies were to be circumcised on the eighth day. He said, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. He knew what tribe he was from. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. He was part of the strictest sect when it came to following the law. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He says, man, I was so zealous for my faith that I persecuted Christians, right? Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, does that mean he was without sin? No, it means you couldn't pin anything on it, right? You couldn't prove anything about, his, about his, uh, his keeping of the law, about anything that he had done to break the law. He says, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me? So under the, the, under the, the, the guidance of Judaism, right, under, under the religious law, under all of that thing, as a Pharisee, all of those things, those were to his credit. Those were gained to him. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss 
for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then he goes on in, in verse 12 to say, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. When we are running a race, let me ask you a question. When you are in the middle of a marathon, have you crossed the finish line yet? No, you haven't. The finish line is still out there in front of you. And Paul is saying, look, I'm running the race. I haven't crossed the finish line yet, but I'm running the race and I'm running that race with endurance and I'm running that race, not with confidence in my own righteousness, but within confident, with confidence in the righteousness that comes from Christ. Not that I've already attained or not already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Forgetting those things that are behind. Now, that doesn't mean forgetting the lessons I learned. That doesn't mean forgetting the examples that I've seen. It means forgetting anything that I might have had confidence in and also forgetting anything that I might have been ashamed of. The good things I did, the bad things I did, none of those are to my credit and ultimately none of them are to my debt because the reality is I'm following Jesus Christ and I'm pressing on. Therefore, let as many as are mature have this mind. In other words, adopt this attitude for yourself. In other words, follow my example. If in anything you think otherwise, or in other words, if you disagree with me, God will reveal even this to you. In other words, God will show you the truth of what I'm saying. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Let's move forward together. We're running the race. Let's be in step with one another and run after Jesus together. Amen? And then in verse 17, he says, Brethren, join in following my example. In other words, there are some who are already following my example. Join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Amen? Paul does not say, just follow Jesus. Paul does not say, oh, don't follow me. Nor does he say, hey, follow me, I've got all the answers. No, what he says is, I'm running after Jesus. There are some others who are running after Jesus with me. How about you join us and let's all run after Jesus together. And if you don't know how to run right, or you don't know how to tie your shoes, or you don't know how to keep the, the rhythm and the step, and if you don't know how to breathe right, guess what? Watch us. Watch what we're doing. We're following Jesus. Now, if as we're following Jesus, one of us decides to take a detour... You don't go after the guy who took the detour. You keep running after Jesus, right? If you see a guy trip over something, what do you do? You help him up. You certainly don't say, oh, he tripped over it. I guess I'll trip over it too. No. You help him up because we're running after Jesus. But here's the beauty of it, y'all. We don't have to run alone. We get to run together as we follow after Jesus. And as we follow good examples, we in turn become good examples. Amen? Let's look at a scripture reference to support that assertion. 1 Thessalonians, if you'll turn there with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, as Paul is writing this epistle to the church in Thessalonica, we'll just start in verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Did you notice he's got some guys running with him as he writes this letter? To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus, 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. I love Paul's pronouns <laughs> in this passage. These are some pronouns I can get on board with, all right? Paul is saying, not I remember you always in my prayers. He's saying, we remember you always in our prayers. So not only was Paul praying for the Thessalonian believers, but Silvanus and Timothy were praying with him for the Thessalonian believers, amen? And we are to pray together. Look, it's wonderful to pray alone, but how much better is it to pray together, amen? Where two or more of you are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst, Jesus says, amen? We need to pray together. And Paul says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in words only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Amen. Paul is saying, look, when we preach the gospel to you, the Lord was present, man. There were signs, there were wonders, there were miracles. You believed, your faith is strong, and you remember the example that we were when we lived among you. And you, he said, became followers of us and of the Lord. Do you see that? Paul is not saying, oh, you became followers of the Lord. He's saying you followed our example. You modeled your walk after the walk that we were living among you. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Amen? So not only, he says, listen, when we were there among you, you received the word of God. And you followed our example. And now you have become an example to all of those around you. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had with you or to you. And how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen? Wow. What an incredible testimony. Paul is saying, when we were among you, man, the power of God was present with the preaching of the gospel and you believed and you took note of the example that we lived before you. And not only did you take, uh, did you take, you know, did you take, uh, <laughs> not only did you take heed to our example, but you've become an example yourself to the point that I don't even have to tell people about your faith. They already know, but your reputation has preceded you. And they're like, wow, it's amazing how those, those Thessalonians, man, they turned from serving idols to worshiping God, and now they're preaching the gospel, and people are coming to faith because of them. What an amazing thing. They followed a good example, and they, in turn, became a good example. Amen? One last passage, and we'll end a little bit early today. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to give you back the 15 minutes I took from you last Sunday. <laughs> In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is writing his final letter, or at least the final letter that we have, to his most faithful protege, to his most diligent disciple, to his son in the faith his mentee, if you will, 
or if we want to get geeky about it, his Padawan, right? <laughs> He's talking to Timothy, and in chapter 2, verse 1, he says to Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Amen? Today we might say, be strong, you know, or the world might say to us, be strong. How do you get strong? You make yourself strong. You get out there, you work. No, Paul is saying, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Amen. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Amen. Christian, man or woman, male or female, I'm telling you, this is not just, he's not, we're not just talking about men here, okay? He's talking about men here with Timothy because he's speaking in the context of the leadership of the church. But this principle applies across the board to all of us. What you have received, you are responsible to give. What you have learned, you are responsible to to teach. The gospel that you have received is incurred by you as a debt that you owe to others. Does that make sense? God's intention is not simply to give the gospel to you. It is to give the gospel through you. And the love that you receive from God, you are to give to others. The grace that you receive from God, you're to give to others. The strength that you are to receive from God, you are to give to others. We are to pass on what God has put in our lives. Amen? Amen. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure. You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember, that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen? Look, are there going to be times on this journey, are there going to be times as you run this race that you stumble? Are there going to be times that you fall? Yes, there are. Does that mean that it is our aim to stumble and fall? Of course not. Does that mean that we have a cavalier attitude about stumbling and falling? That we're like, ah, it's all right, it's all right if I fall. Here's the thing. When you fall, you may get back up and run again, but did it feel good to fall? No. No, it hurts. And not only does it hurt, but it hinders your race afterwards because now you're running with a limp, right? And so... We don't want to fall, but if we do fall, we know that God's grace is sufficient for us because though we are at times faithless, he is faithful for he cannot deny himself and we belong to him. Remind them of these things, Paul tells Timothy, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. In other words, don't argue with each other about unimportant matters. But be diligent. The word diligent is one of my favorite words in scripture because it implies intentionality and purpose, right? No one is diligent accidentally. (coughs) Diligence requires 
watchfulness. It, it, it requires attentiveness. It requires intentionality and purpose. So what are we to be diligent about? We're to be diligent to present ourselves as workers approved to God, right? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So what are we to be diligent in according to that passage? We're to be diligent in regards to the word of truth. We're to study the word of truth. We are to know our Bibles, amen? We're to be diligent in the study of God's word so that we don't have to be ashamed when God examines us in regards to our obedience to his word. But he goes on to say, but shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. So here we have two guys who at one point might have been good examples, but did they stay the course? Did they stay on track? No, they didn't. They departed. They, they got distracted. And he said, they've strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen? But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. You know, this is what he was talking about, the writer of Hebrews, when he said, lay aside the sin that so easily ensnares you, right? Lay it aside. Don't engage with that. Set that aside. Flee also youthful lusts. But instead... Pursue righteousness, faith, and love and peace. Who is our righteousness? Jesus Christ. In whom do we have faith? In Jesus Christ. Who is love? God is love. Jesus is love. Who is our peace? Jesus is our peace. So if we are pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace, who are we pursuing? Jesus. We're pursuing Jesus. But are we running alone? No. Look, the next passage says, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Amen? Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Paul said it most succinctly in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, when he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen? We should be able to say the same. Follow me as I follow Christ. I should be able to say, follow, I can follow you as you follow Christ because we are running that race together. Amen? So let us set aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us flee youthful lusts. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith. Because let me tell you, there is a great cloud of witnesses waiting at the finish line to welcome us home. Amen. There is an amazing reward that is waiting for us at the end of it. You know, after you run a race, you may want to sit down. Guess what? There's a throne for us to sit down on because Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God and he's invited us to sit down on his throne with him. What a glorious prize awaits us if we will simply run with endurance the race that is set before us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father.